Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series entitled God's Mission, My Mission. And this is lesson number one in that series entitled God's Mission to Us, Part One. It's a lesson for October 7 of 2023. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayers. Father, we appreciate all the enlightenment that you've given us through Scripture. With the help of Ellen White, we thank you for the guidance that you've given us in telling us what to do and what not to do and guiding us how to more closely follow your plans for our lives. Help us to see now in this lesson uh, and the lessons that will follow how we can better represent you to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mission. What does mission mean? Mission from a Christian standpoint st finds its origin and purpose in God himself. Ephesians 4 tells us that, that before this world was created, God had in mind a mission as to what he would do with this earth and the people who live here. It did not begin with Paul or even Jesus Christ or Moses or Abraham or even Adam. It began with God in heaven. In a broader sense, the term mission can apply to embassies that are part of some country's effort to reach out to other countries. When we talk about the American embassy or the American mission in African countries, for example, embassy and mission mean almost the same thing. And what is the purpose of these missions? It is to reach out in whatever way possible to better relate the United States, in this case, of America to people of that country. In the same way, the Christian mission is for the purpose of trying to better educate people about God. Sorry. Our Creator and His efforts to reach out to each one of us. And we have, this goes way back to the first chapter in the Bible, Jim. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, And now we will make men, make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic, wild, large, and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. That's, of course, from our Good News translation that we often use. Does that um, mean that God is male and female? That's a rather that mean, free or, translation. That, that's, yeah, or that, does that, that mean that yeah, in the same kind of general characteristics as man with the ability to think and talk and um, and reason. Well, the Elohim said, let us make man in our image, in the image uh, of the Elohim, not the image of, the, of Yahweh, so. Well, uh, yeah, in this particular chapter that uses those terms, um, the names of God in the Bible are both male and female. I haven't counted up, and I, it would be difficult for me to do that, but I know that there's quite a number of names that in the original languages are, are male, and a lot, of num a lot of those names in original languages are, are female. So, of course, we believe that God created both males and female, male and female, and of course, he, and I've seen studies that show that many of the characteristics that we consider to be more prominent in males, God has those, and characteristics that we see as being more prominent in females, God has those. So there are many ways you can take that. Carrie, you want to give us what Helen White says? Yeah, I'm wondering though, where does it exactly start? I can, is it in the middle they would be constantly gaining? No, there, from the writings of Helen right, right. Oh, I see, to, right up there. <coughs> Uh, so long as they, that in brackets, Adam and Eve, remain loyal to the divine law, their capacity to know, to enjoy, and to love would continually increase. They would be constantly gaining new treasures of knowledge, discovering fresh springs of happiness, and obtaining clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the measurable, unfailing love of God. And that's from Mrs. White, Patriarch and Prophet 5. No, 51, one. So God created Adam and Eve with the intention that they would go to be like him. 
or them, if you want to say. He placed them in a perfect garden with ideal circumstances, hoping that all would go well. Of course, he knew in advance what was going to happen. However, God's number one characteristic is love, and he does not want robots. He wants people who can love him in return. In order to love, one must also have the freedom not to love or even to hate. In other words, freedom is freedom. It means you can make your own choices. So God has to allow for what we call freedom or free will. That is a very risky proposition. So if you want to read that in more in detail and all the ins and outs of it, go to our handout at the theox.org and look for uh, a handout entitled Love. It's under general topics at the beginning. So going on, Gordon. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 from the Good News Bible. He, that is God, said to him, that is Adam, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. But they didn't okay. die the same day, did they? The no. word is, that is translated apparently as muth, which means died, and they did it twice, meaning that you're really going to die. Doesn't that mean the same day? That's a good news translation's interpretation, which is okay. in this case not right. Well, there's a lot of translations that say the same thing. Because uh, God that doesn't mean it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean it's correct. Yeah. Because God wanted his children to love him back, he felt it was necessary for him to allow Satan to have access to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So why would that be necessary? He needs to give them freedom, right? So how did God allow Satan to have access to Adam and Eve at, at quote, the tree, end quote? This is why it says, the tree, of no the tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and of their love to God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. If they should disregard his, his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not to follow them with the continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Should they accept, at, should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to, to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instruction that he had seen fit to impart. Mrs. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. Okay, so now we're going to say something that very few people seem to have recognized. The tree was not placed in the garden primarily to test attempt Adam and Eve. It was placed there as a protection by limiting the access that Satan would have to our first parents. Satan could not follow them wherever they went, trying to tempt them at every corner. All they had to do to avoid Satan's temptations was to stay away from that tree. And they should have installed one of those little electric fences, you know, that says, don't go beyond this. Yeah. Would have been so wonderful. The great controversy had already started and God knew what Satan was capable of doing. So we know what happened next, Charles. This is an interesting text. I talk with my Protestant friends and have fun with this one. Yes. The snake replied, that's not true, you will not die. So if you live throughout um, eternity in hell, yes. you are believing in, when, believing in what uh, the Satan is saying. So yeah. anyways, it's interesting. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. From Bible study guide, that moment changed God's original plan and purpose for the newly created planet Earth. The mission of salvation, which has been designed before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, has now been implemented Okay, let's take a moment and talk about that. Why do you think so few people have thought of the idea that the tree was actually intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve? Have you ever heard that in a sermon? Uh, very very no. few understand it. Yeah. 
I, I said, very few seem to understand that. Well, they point. started right out as a, that it's a test. Yeah. As a, as a, uh, well, it's only a, but you see, it was a test, but only a test if you go there. So it's supposed to be a protection because you're not supposed to go there. Anyway. Well, they just said, don't eat, don't eat of it. Yeah. You can eat of all of them, but if you eat of that one, you're going to yeah. die. And uh, they say, it doesn't say that you're going to be killed. No. It doesn't say that God is going to become the active agent in killing no, you. It just says say. you're going to die. That's the yeah. way the physics of the universe work. Yeah. So the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. This is from Ellen White again. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal. Romans, Romans 16, 25 from the Revised Version. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he convinced, I'm sorry, that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3:16, and quoted in Desire of Ages 22. So now the next question I want to ask you is this. Was God foolish when he, uh, let me just back it up before I say that. Did Jesus understand fully everything that he was going to have to do when he came to this earth before he left heaven? Yes. It seems like he did. And yet he agreed to come and take that risk. Yeah. Wow. Try to. That, that was an ultimate example of other centeredness, was it mm, not? Yeah. All human beings, all intelligent creatures, finite beings, are self centered. And Jesus is the elder, ultimate example of other centeredness. Yeah. So did we answer the, your first question? Why is it easier to think of the tree as being a test than a protection? Well, because you have to think things through to realize that it could possibly be a protection. Just superficially read, it's a test. Superficially thought of, it's a test. Yeah. So, okay. so you have, to, you have, to, get, you have yeah. to get well, beyond the, the literal things in the Bible to, to say have, that. Yeah, you have protection. to see, you, you have to take the great controversy view, which means it's okay, I take, take advantage of the fact that Satan is already there, and we know that there's already been a rebellion in heaven. God knows that Satan is going to do everything he possibly can to get at Adam and Eve, so. Yeah, it just seems like it would be so much easier to say this is a protection rather than God's testing you. Mm -hmm. So that's well, why he asked the question, how many I times know, have you asked I know. this being a priest but from the, the pulpit? And it boils down to, they didn't listen. And that's well, the ultimate Knowing thing. what we know about the Bible, could there be other places that this same principle is true? Absolutely. That superficially, we look at it and it's... Lots of places. No way, I don't think you're in a position to say it couldn't have been that way. Okay, so some more questions. Try to imagine the discussions that went on between God and the heavenly angels right after Adam and Eve sinned. What did the angels expect to happen next? Zap. Hmm. That's a pretty clear statement. <laughs> <laughs> or banished yeah. like yeah. Lucifer. Uh, uh, did, or did they know that there was a plan of salvation? That was already. It doesn't seem it. like they did, but they also knew that. Uh, so, they, do you not think that they questioned why did this one third of the angels get thrown out? What mm -hmm. prompted it? I exactly. want to think that they questioned and they had the answers. Just, just my thought. Okay, so let's take that question one step further. How do you think God felt as he watched Eve and then Adam eat that forbidden fruit? Well, it didn't shock him. He, he saw. He knew ahead of time. <laughs> he saw <laughs> the fulfillment of 
the promise, uh, Genesis 3.15, the cross, and he saw the final triumph if you have, of God's love. If you have freedom to choose, a certain percentage are going to make a different percent, a different choice so than, than, than the choice that, that is right. Yeah. And you know, odds are that's, that's the way, uh, cr but how are you going to learn? Yeah. So if God, Trial and error. <laughs> if God had sent an angel right just before that time and say, don't go there. Yeah. Satan would, would say, would, that's unjust. That's, yeah, not that's unfair. unfair. That's unfair. That's unfair, yeah. 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 So but Satan, yet, but yet maybe, you, maybe the outcome would be different. Well, remember the story is, in what we've read there, there's nothing in the story that says that any intelligent creatures had ever died. Yeah. So when he says, if you eat of it, you're going to die, no intelligent, so when the serpents, or Satan yeah. speaking through the serpent, we'll just use that, he, he, was he lying? You know, the, the uh, uh, warning is, past performance does not guarantee future results. We've right. all heard that thing on, on yeah. a, as a commercial, right? Well, the, so past performance, the, the infinite would have never been involved in killing any intelligent creatures. There's no record, at no. least we don't have any record of it. And then when he says, you're, now they're like God, they're like one of us, or you're gonna be like God, that's a true statement also. But you could, apparently you could tell truth and in a way, to lead, yeah, yeah, you could just leave enough out of the data, uh, enough of the story that. Uh, yeah. you know. We do not know how long a time span was between the creation and the fall. Exactly. Not, how do you know that Christ himself didn't come down and say, look, I need to tell you a story? Well, if this, you believe Alan White, he did. There you are. Right, right. You see, he, he, he I mean, you, you know that God. And even the angels came down and talked to them. She says very clearly, the angels talked to them and warned them about the tree. Now exactly, we don't know exactly how much detail uh, about that, but it's there. That's what I it says. I want to think even uh, John 3.16 was yeah. there. I want to think, you do this, I myself will be hanging on the tree. Yeah. You stay away from, I want to think that this was all explained. Why was, why was this earth created? Go, need to go back farther. Yes. The evil had started, yes. yeah. we don't know how far back. You can say uh, millions, you can say thousands, you can say years or whatever, but it happened. Right. So how is God, as an educator, as a parent, duty of a parent is to teach the kids, is to, how is he gonna educate him? Through trial and error, experience. Yeah. Maybe he's, he's, he can't short circuit uh, a learning experience. And the it's kids so, that in that illustration are is the rest of the universe. Yeah, well, that's what, what I'm trying to was driving at. Uh, thanks for bringing education it. for the rest of the universe. Exactly, and yeah. also for us. Yeah, but yeah. unfortunately we, we, are the we suffer. For, yeah, yeah. The, universe. the universe and triumph. Yeah. The ultimate triumph of God's love is going to be more meaningful, more beautiful. Yeah, and had it not happened, I mm -hmm. believe. Satan, the, the evilness um, of Satan is manifested the fullest yeah. by what had happened. So, so what does a good parent do with rebellious children? Think of God's situation. We've already sort of suggested this. God has an entire universe of beings that love and adore him. They are all anxious to do his bidding. Why should he care about this earth, one tiny blue marble that is the only spot in the universe that we know about at least, I'm sure it's true, that is in almost total rebellion against him. And yet we see that over the last 6,000 plus years, God has done almost everything you can think of to try to reach out to us. Well, Revelation 12, 4 sure. says a third. Now that was uh, a third is close to a half. So I don't know that it's a whole lot different uh, with, with just the human beings, as it was prior to the creation of the human beings. It's, it, that's the way, yeah. but why, why does the evil exist? Freedom. Yeah. And God, and without freedom, you don't have love. Mm -hmm. And God is love. Mm -hmm. So you, the answer as to why there's evil is, God is love. You we have to have the freedom to make it make false or decisions that are self-destructive, as well as have collateral damage against other yeah. intelligent creatures. 
So almost to the very end of the Bible, in Revelation 14, 6 and 7, of course, was the beginning of the famous three angels' messages, we are told that God is still trying to reach out and warn us of what is coming. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Then I saw another, another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news. Notice that eternal message. To announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor, this is using the British spelling there, God and, pray, God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. And then in Genesis 3, 9 to 15, Jim? But the Lord God called out to man, to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, and I hid from you because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. Did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? The man answered, the woman you put here, here with me gave me the fruit, and I ate it. The Lord God answered the woman, Why did you do this? She replied, The snake tricked me into eating it. Then the Lord God said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear the curse from now on. You will crawl on your belly and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will be will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite, give me, bite her offspring's heel. From the Bible study guide, of course, God knew exactly where they were. Dominated by fear, Adam and Eve were the ones who needed to see what was going on, but they also needed to be confronted as they could understand the dreadful consequences of their sin. Satan has needed they also. they also needed to be defeated for this. God then began to present his mission, the plan of redemption. You got to remember, Eve had was determined she was going to do it. Well, the only hope of reconciling... <laughs> she, she, she had need to get a grip on that. The only hope of reconciling the world to himself is his plan. In Genesis 3, 14 and 15, Carrie... And the Lord God said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse. From now on you will crawl on your belly and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her off Springs Hill, that's from the Good News Bible. The Bible Study Guide goes on to say, if scripture as a whole is about God's unrelenting outreach to humanity, Genesis 3.9 could be considered the question that drives it. Genesis 3 is the narrative of the tragic attempt made by Adam and Eve in a spirit of self-assertion and determination to be independent of God. This chapter, and I, you know, I read that and yes, I say, I don't think either one of them, I think that's what they were doing, but I don't think they realized the implications. I think if, if someone had told them, you know, you're directly violating God's directions, they would have stopped. This chapter is also a reminder of the reality of sin and its consequences. The consequences of Adam and Eve's choice led them to hide themselves from God. God's first response to the plight of humanity came in the form of a question addressed to Adam, where are you? Understanding the purpose of this question is essential to the understanding of the intent of the entire drive of Scripture from the Bible Study Guide. So, Gordon, you want to take on those next couple things there? Genesis 3, 9, but the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? In Good News Bible. Okay. And the Bible Study Guide says, to start with, where are you is not a theological question. It is a missiological one. This question reveals that despite their wrong choice, God has not forsaken Adam and Eve. Human rebellion does not subtract anything from God's desire to intimately relate with humans. God still loves and seeks his wandering children. The question, where are you? The first one the Bible attributes to God 
speaks more of a condition than a location. Thus, the question was not intended to find out where exactly Adam and Eve were hiding away from God. God never asked questions as a means of gathering information. His omniscience is a source of limitless knowledge, even knowledge of what does not yet exist. Being omniscient, God knew exactly where Adam and Eve's hiding place was, what they had done and what condition they were in. Adam's absence at his usual meeting place was, with God was a clear evidence that something was wrong. Therefore, the question God asked Adam in Genesis 3.9 is not, where are you? In reference to Adam's geographical location, the question is, the question, where are you, was about relationship. Where are you relationally? With the first consequence of sin revealed in the previous verse, God's question was primarily in intended to make Adam and Eve think about their relationship with God. The question was intended to make them think about the consequence of their disobedience to God. Adam and Eve were being given the opportunity to examine themselves and acknowledge their guilt. God's question is the equivalent of the following line of inquiry. Why are you not at our usual rendezvous? What has happened to our relationship that you are attempting to keep a distance from me? What is the meaning of these fig leaves you are covering yourself with? <laughs> yeah, as if fig leaves could affect, affect God's vision in some way. Satan's false promise to Adam and Eve was that through disobedience they would become like gods. In other words, sin would improve their lives. We, we know how that turned out. Adam and Eve ended up naked instead of being, becoming like gods. Their solution to their new plight was to sow fig leaves to hide their nakedness. If this solution had solved the situation, they would not have sought to hide from the presence of God. Rather, they would have confronted God for not wanting their ultimate well-being. Moreover, the quote, where are you, was the earnest cry of a missionary God whose anguished inquiry betrays divine awareness of the gulf that had been created between him and humans. The question was also his invitation for his lost children to return to a relationship of love and trust with him. In light of the promise in Genesis 3.15, God's question bears a promise of hope. Although sin casts its shadow over the divine plan for humanity on account of Adam and Eve's disobedience, God's plan has not been defeated. In the midst of judgment, the promise of Redeemer is made. All that from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Yes, thank you, Gordon. And that's a lengthy passage, but I thought we needed to look at that to, because it's the sort of a, the building blocks that they're going to make, uh, put the rest of the lessons on, so we needed to go through, through it in some detail. After the fall, just think about this, came the flood, and then the Tower of Babel. How do you think things were looking for God's mission? Did it look like God was losing and like Satan was winning? You bet. I certainly think so. In the eyes of the onlooking universe, Dropping down to Abraham, Abraham's visit to Egypt and the decree forbidding the Egyptians to associate with foreigners made it possible. Remember what happened to Abraham went there and he had this very good looking wife who was probably 70 years old and the Pharaoh wanted, to, wanted her in his harem to see what- Are you implying that 70 year old women can't look good? <laughs> no, I'm not that no. implying that at all. I'm just, I said- Other than, other than Sarah? <laughs> Sarah, I didn't, I didn't come on there, be careful. Mm. Okay. Um, Sorry. And, and so, you know, what happened, and, and then Pharaoh saw or learned about somehow or other that Abraham was actually married to her, and then he, he said, he, he already knew that Abraham was a, had a very powerful connection with some kind of God, and so then he threw him out and he said, take all these things with you and please don't ever come back, don't bring any of your kind back, we're afraid of people like you that have that kind of power. And so, what, what was the result? It made it possible further down in history for the Israelites to live in Egypt without just melting into Egyptian society and disappearing completely from history. The Israelites grew, up from, grew from a small group into a nation living in Egypt, but in isolation from the Egyptians. You can are, you, are you trying to say that God 
made Abram lie in order to protect the Israelites later? No, no I'm, I'm, huh? No, yeah. I I'm, 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 I'm quoting you something that I would get from Romans 8, and that would be verse... Uh, 8, 28. 20, is it 28? I think it's 28, which actually says, in all things, God works for good. So, so in spite of Abraham's In spite of Abraham, God, God used deception. it. But he really didn't lie. Deception probably is a better word. Yeah. Much he deception. didn't tell the whole truth. He didn't tell the whole truth. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that is the definition of deception. Yeah. <laughs> you just put the cyanide capsule in a ball of hamburger. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the net result is, is okay. desired. <laughs> Who's next? Me. Genesis yeah. 39, 2. Verse, verse 2, verse 21 and 23. The Lord is with Joseph and made him successful. He lived in the house of his Egyptian master. That was verse 2, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and blessed him so that the jailer was pleased with him. Verse 23. The jailer did not have to look for anything for which Joseph was did not have to look after anything for which Joseph was responsible because the Lord was with Joseph and made him succeed in everything he did. Well, we know historically that at first the Egyptians were thankful for Joseph and the miraculous preparations that he arranged for their preservation. But when the Egyptians, Egyptians rose up and threw out their foreign rulers because at that time they were ruled by foreigners, a new pharaoh that, quote, knew not Joseph, that would be an Egyptian, native Egyptian, forced the children of Israel into slavery. After about 200 years, God called Moses to rescue his people out of Egypt. We know that story. And the days following the Exodus, God chose a new and more direct way of trying to relate to his children. In a kind of sandbox demonstration, God laid out the plan of salvation for them in the tent tabernacle, along with its ceremonies. Charles? Ellen White, the sacrificial offerings and the priesthood of the Jewish system were, institu were instituted to represent the death and mandatorial work of Christ. All these ceremonies had no meaning and no virtue only as they related to Christ, who was himself the foundation of an who brought into existence the entire system. The Lord had made known to Adam, Abel, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and the ancient worthies, especially Moses, that the ceremonial system of the sacrifices and the priesthood of themselves were not sufficient to secure the salvation of one soul. Now that's a very significant passage yes. there from Ellen White written back in 1872 in Spirit of Prophecy. Why is that significant? Well, there's a lot of people who want to make that as if it's the whole plan of salvation and everything has to match that and so forth. No, that was just a, a child's play version of the plan of salvation. I'm going through reading about that part and the use yeah, of the scriptures in my daily reading that when you go through this, that becomes salvation itself, not that it was to look forward to the special one coming. Yeah. So Exodus 29 now, verses 43 to 46, the Lord said through Moses, there I will meet the people of Israel and the dazzling light of my presence will make the place holy. Hmm. What does holy mean? His presence. It means his presence, his presence makes it holy. The word for holy in both Hebrew and Greek literally means to be set apart. It makes it special. I will make the tent and the altar holy and I will set Aaron and his sons apart to serve me as priests. I will live among the people of Israel and I will be their God. They will know that I am the Lord, that's Yahweh, their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I could live among them. I am Yahweh or the Lord their God. In light of the stories, that's from our Good News Bible, in light of the stories that we have looked at already, how has your life been impacted by God? Have you ever stopped to sit down and say, okay, 
how has my relationship to God affected me? God has attempted again and again to draw his children closer to him. Pick, pick a spot many thousands of years later, Isaiah 46. Jim? The Lord said, remember what happened long ago. Acknowledge that I alone am God and that there is no one else like me. From the beginning, I predicted the outcome. Long ago, I foretold what would happen. I said that my plans would never fail, that I would do any, everything I intended to do. And That's God's an example of God's foreknowledge. Yeah. And yet there's those things, oh, God couldn't possibly know the future. Yeah. Because you wouldn't be free. Finally, That's more than... what you get here at, at yeah. the... Finally, more than 500 years later, it was necessary for God to take his ultimate step and come in person to correctly represent himself to human beings. And we know that story. Carrie? Reading from Matthew 1, verses 18 to 23. This was how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they were married, she found out she was going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was a man who always did what was right. That's quite a statement. Yeah, mm -hmm. but he did not want to disgrace Mary publicly. Let me do that again, publicly. So he made plans to break the engagement privately. While he was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, December, descendant rather of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she was conceived. She will have a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sinners. Now all this happened in order to make what the Lord had said through the prophet come true. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, our Bible study guide adds, God with us, Emmanuel. God had dwelt among his people within the sanctuary. Now he dwelt with them in the physical person of Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, with the birth of Jesus, God presented in concrete ways his continuous desire to be with us in nature and mission. The Son of God was fully human and fully divine, and he was the one who affirmed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, we have that, and that's from our Bible study guide. There it is again in John 14, 6, the same expression. And then we have John 1, 14 to 18. Gordon? The Word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw His glory, the glory which He received as the Father's only Son. That's not as opposed to daughter, but really only manifestation, I guess. So yes. John spoke about Him. He cried out, This is the one I was talking about when I said, He comes after me, but He is greater than I am because He existed before I was born. Out of the fullness of his grace, he has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is the same as God and is at the Father's right side. He has made him known. Good News Bible. So how has the humanity of Jesus Christ and all that he did as a human being affected your personal life? Without a doubt, the life and death of Jesus was God's ultimate revelation. Everything he did during his entire life, and especially during the three and a half years of his ministry, was a representation of the truth about God. And look at these two quotations to represent that. Myra? Colossians 1, 15 and 19 to 20. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. Verse 19. For it was by God's own decision that, his, that the Son has in himself the full nature of God, though the Son then, through the Son, through the Son then, 
God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. So this is where the plan started long before. Okay. And notice that what happens, God makes it so that what happens here on this earth is going to impact the entire universe. That's what's really going on here. God made peace through his son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Good News Bible. Okay, here's a fantastic statement. Charles from Ellen White. Uh, Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, himself, humbling, humbling himself, mm -hmm. veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him the history that we have of the life of Jesus would not have been changed. In every act of Christ, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Wow. Now, let me say something. I don't care what this lady stole it from, but this is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. This is really, truly beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, that's, it's the truth. Yes. Finally, at the end of his life, Jesus agreed to die that awful death, not from crucifixion or the beatings or, blood, or the blood loss, but rather from separation from his Father, who is the only source of life. Remember, he said what? Why am I, you know, why, why am I losing so much blood? Why am I crucified? No, he said, why hast thou forsaken me? That is what is known as the second death, the ultimate death that sinners will die in the end. And for anybody who wants to read more details, Desire of Ages 753 to 754. But while his disciples thought that the end had come and there was nothing more for them, in fact, their real mission was just beginning. And what did Christ expect his disciples to do? Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and if we were doing the King James, we could all repeat it by memory, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. There's gonna be a theme for our whole series of lessons. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Notice that he promised that while asking us to spread the truth about him throughout the entire world, he would be with us always. If you personally went out and tried to witness to your neighbors and friends, do you think you could rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you? Has God ever failed in any of his jobs that he set out to do? <laughs> but Jesus was still not done. During that last evening that he spent with his disciples before his arrest, persecution, and death, he said, John 14, 1 to 3, Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you'll be where I am. Can I interrupt for a minute? Yes. You asked the question, has God ever failed? Yes. Some people would think that's heresy to just ask that question. Yes. But he but, hasn't succeeded in getting us home yet, has he? No. Because but is so that, is that failure? Fault? No, it's... It's whether he's, it's his fault or not. He hasn't succeeded yet. But he gave us the power of choice. I think it was Keith Miller uh, says, of all people in this world, we Christians are the most miserable because we know enough about heaven to have a longing to go there. But we're madly in love with this world that we really, mm -hmm. really don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> well, there's a lot of truth in there. A lot of truth. Well, and I think a lot of times we think God has failed because we put our, our mission above God's mission. Hmm. 
and we think yeah. that our idea of what we think God wants us to do is the right thing, and we make God in our image. Yeah. If indeed yeah. something backwards about what, that. What is all of this so far? Where I don't know if the rest of the lessons are going to be. All of this so far is a, I would say, somewhat of a feeble attempt to bring about what God has always attempted to do, and that is to have harmony in His creation. Mm -hmm. All of it, which is a state of at one -ment. Unfortunately, religions, Judaism and Christianity, and uh, then others have glommed onto it, that it's a, 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 an atonement, to atone. It's all, it's all a big lie. Yeah. It's not an event. It's everything God has done is mm -hmm. for to bring harmony in, among His creation. And, and all this that we thrash very, around with. Very with well. a, it huh? works very well before to turn you things move around. On, before yeah. you move on, just kind of help it. I think this page, uh, page seven uh, of 10 pages, Matthew 28, 18, 20. That's why we're here. Yeah. That's why, um, that's the whole, whole lesson, the whole three months. Yeah. Okay. And of all people, this is from experience, even what has happened to me today, noontime. We have a beautiful message that no one else has been endowed with yeah. to go to the world. And by the way, I believe that the church as we know it today is not, cannot, and cannot possibly exist for too long. Yeah, as it is today. Yeah, as it is today. And we will be taking this message to the world. And it's coming very quickly, quicker than we think. But again, it's the, what other Christians can go and talk with Muslims and Hindus, for example. Mm. But we, because of our lifestyle, we have so much to share. Yeah. So much to share. And it's time for us to wake up, really, truly, and realize mm. who we are. Well, but Take ultimately, is the truth is about God. the one, the one true yeah, God. But He has given us the message. The message is worship. He has given us the method, the means. The means is not the mighty dollar. It is the beautiful health message that he has given to us. Um, the whole message. Must use it. Yeah, the whole message. Yes. Notice that he all said once again, I will come back and take you to be with me. And Ellen White says the work of redemption will be complete in the place where sin abounded. And this, this just, I have to jump up and say hallelujah every time I read this passage. The place where sin abounded God's grace much more abounds. The earth itself, right here, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to be not only ransomed, but exalted. Imagine this little blue marble, bar marble. God is going to make this his future headquarters in the entire universe. Here, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift, Emmanuel, God with us. Wow. Zarb Ages 26. Are we prepared to work with God in hastening that wonderful day? Jim? From the Bible study guide. Weekly challenges. Throughout this quarter, you will be invited to engage intentionally in God's mission. This will be an opportunity to see and experience the God of mission at work in your life. Take advantage of this moment for personal reflection and take, be ready to share what you have learned with your class. Additionally, the challenge up will encourage you to increase your involvement in God's mission. The challenge Pray every day of the coming week for God to open your heart to be part of his mission. Challenge up. Learn the name of someone in your life you don't already know. A neighbor, co-worker, shopkeeper, business driver, janitor, etc. Bus driver. But on oh, bus driver, what is it? <laughs> I, I jumped up the janitor. Begin praying for him or her each day. Okay. So they're going to give us some suggestions with every lesson, ways that we might comfortably or uncomfortably reach out to the people around us that we do business with or we relate to or somehow or other. And just imagine if the entire church did that. 
Well, you, you, you got these commercials that you see from Billy Graham and this guy over here in Riverside, uh, and they tell you, you know, say the sinner prayer, and they've been, because uh, otherwise, you, uh, if you don't, you're going to not yeah. be able to avoid the fires of hell. Yeah. I mean, that's traditional Christianity, and Christianity is, is a terrible uh, picture of God. Yeah. So, well, uh, and, 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 and but it, don't, don't say that. It, the misunderstanding which is commonly presented is a misunderstanding of God. Well, they pay big money on the TV to, to well, spread that. Big money is not well, the answer to everything either. But okay. it's still deceptive. It's still an adulteration of the, of the true message. And it's yeah. bearing false, false witness. It's not about telling about what your neighbor did. It's bearing false witness about the Creator. Yeah. Carrie, Ellen White again. Yes. Christ did not tell his disciples that their work would be easy, but they would not be left to fight alone. He assured them that he would be with them and that if they would go forth in faith, they should move under the shield of omnipotence. So long as they obeyed his word and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. Go to all nations, he bade them, go to the farthest part of the habitable globe and be assured that my presence will be with you even there. Labor in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will forsake you. I will be with you always, helping you to perform your duty, guiding, comforting, sanctifying, sustaining you, giving you success in speaking words that shall draw the attention of others in heaven. And that's from Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, 29. Wow. Gordon, you want to take up that next one? In the Bible Study Guide, think about what it means that God's first words to fallen humanity were not, what have you done? Or, why have you disobeyed me? Instead, the first words were, where are you? Mm. What comfort should this truth give us regarding God's intention for us and our loved ones? Think about what it means that God himself in the person of Jesus came to this world in order to save us. Christ on the cross was the ultimate manifestation of God as a God of mission. What does this tell us about his character? The mission belongs to God, therefore he will equip and empower people for the task. In light of this reality, when you look at the challenges of worldwide evangeliz evangelization, how can you feel, how can you deal with feelings and attitudes of inadequacy or fear, inadequacy or fear, Bible it, Study Guide for Friday. Yeah, does it, you know, if you just take a casual look at what needs to happen to, to, do it, to witness to seven billion people, it seems overwhelming. God, however, did not give up on his mission. He was determined to redeem and to reconcile his lost children. Even today, as so much evil has exploded in our world, God refuses to give up on us. And of course, let's be honest, Satan knows what? This is curtains for him. If God succeeded at this point, it's, it's all over for him. Yeah. As we have already mentioned, the ultimate revelation of God's ministry, his character and his love, happened when Jesus came to this earth. Um, through that, and I'm going to just read because we're about to run out of time. Through the different aspects of his ministry, Christ not only announced God's reign with prophetic urgency, but he also embodied it by giving God's redemptive mission a face, a voice, and hands. By healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead, Christ demonstrated God's power to fully reverse the curse of the fall. By so doing, Christ reformulated the concept of God's love so that people could understand it, experience it, and be drawn to God. The substitutionary death of Christ was God's ultimate way of seeking to reconcile alienated humanity to himself. Of course, remember John 3.16. Christ's ministry and sacrifice are mission par excellence. That's from our Bible study guide. So, the life of Jesus Christ was substitutionary in the sense that his coming and living and dying made it clear what choices we need to make to experience God's salvation. His life and his death give us a clear choice. We can live lives as close as possible to, um, 
as close to his pattern as possible and live forever, or we will die the death that he died, separated from God, the only source of life, and be dead forever. The last words of Jesus recorded in the Bible, spoken to John or written down in the book of Revelation are, yes, I am coming soon, Revelation 22, 20. God is guaranteed that his mission will be successful. The peace and harmony that once existed throughout the universe will be restored when sin and sinners cease to exist and the righteous will again enjoy the fruit from the tree of life. <clears throat> so we read about this. Uh, where are we? Myra? I'm sorry. Revelation 22. 22. Number Revelation 22, 2. The river of the water of life is flowing down the middle of the city streets. On each side, the river is the tree. Is, each side of the river is the tree of life, which bears the fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. So I'm going to give you one last question to think about. Do you think the tree of life bore one different, a different fruit every month when it was back in the Garden of Eden? Hmm. <laughs> That's the only answer, I guess. Hmm. Why would there be months back then? Well, because we're, we're still circulating around the moon. I mean, I'm sorry, around the, around the sun and the moon is circulating around us. Well, to finish up, every attempt to cover our own nakedness before God is just as unwise as Adam and Eve's attempt to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. Every humanly designed solution to deal with sin and guilt is utterly inadequate and worthless. The fig leaves of our good works, reputation, and church titles do not suffice as spiritual coverings. The only God, I'm sorry, only God can supply us with the adequate spiritual covering. The only lasting solution is the covering He offers to us through Jesus. God does not cover our sin and guilt. He takes them away first and then covers us instead with Christ's righteousness. And many times we've read, we read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 in this class, where he takes off the filthy garments and then puts on his robe of righteousness. I'm talking about the, the Joshua the high priest in the Old Testament. So just as God went out searching for Adam and Eve, he saw out searching for us. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word, of seeing these marvelous truths presented. May we not only understand them and comprehend them, but live them out as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.